Well, good morning. It's um, nine o'clock on the dot, so um, may as well uh, may as well get started. Thanks to uh, all of you for, for for coming. It's always very gratifying to see sort of a full room of people. Um, you know, I've been working with RCBV for a couple of years and done these styles of presentations and workshops a few times. Uh, it has its challenges at either length and format. Sometimes I just do an hour. Three hours isn't bad. Um, I use more time if I have more time. Um, I tend to be bad at that in the sense that I lecture too much and don't break too many examples in. So I try to break that up a little bit this time to get you actually to do something hands-on because it's, uh, that's, that's, that's an important good feeling to walk home having done, having done an example. So um, uh, if you've seen these slides or presentation before, it's sort of, it, it follows a similar uh, format, we, you know, we have roughly three hours with a break in between, so a little bit of motivation. You know, why would we consider doing this? Because it's obviously extra effort. If we're deciding to go away from R and working with the second programming language, there must be a reason for that. And then a little bit of how. Uh, there's a little bit of background and sort of dry material we have to go through and just how things work. And I've changed that a little bit over the years and tried to make it, you know, less dry. Um, that was more amplified. Can you hear me well enough from the portable microphone? Does that... Does it pick up? It seems so, right? Okay. Otherwise, sort of, sh yeah, yeah. And as, as general rules, just raise your hands, wave, ask, shout. Just you know, feel free to interrupt at any moment when I'm when I'm unclear or contradicting myself. And then I have a bunch of examples. You see the 164 in the corner. That is also a reflection of the fact that I'm generally always sort of crazy um, and sort of tend to put too much material in. So I think we'll just fast forward through a couple of those. So consider a couple of these slides really as, as backup material. So this is a really good, um, by now old, motivating example that I set up many years ago for this. It came from a question on the R help mailing list that Greg Snow answered. And it's, it's what I find a really good example of, you know, why R is cool. So the first question is sort of, why do we do R? And that's it's sort of, this is, this is three lines, it's really old code. Code. It's, it's base R, there's, there's, there's no tidies, no tibbles. Faceful is a data set that comes with R. We're subsetting it in the normal way, getting a column from it, using a somewhat advanced statistical method. Density estimation is something that we can do more easily with computers, whereas in the 20s, 30s, 40s, people were just you know, hand counting histograms. This is an improvement to it. Uh, we're getting an object back from the density function that is, that is rich and has structure, object. Um, in the, you know, quote, unquote, object-oriented programming sense. And we're just sticking that into plot. And we don't have to do anything more. And something reasonably pretty, our standards have risen since, and uh, reasonably informative comes back. So we see the plot of this density. It's clearly bimodal. We see a couple of informative values being displayed, how many observations there were, what bandwidth um, for the density estimation got, esti got, uh, got selected heuristically. And that's all pretty cool. But you know, that's not, that's not breathtaking. You can probably do that in MATLAB, Julia, Mathematica, a million other languages. Where it gets really cool, and that was the real point of that answer on the mailing list, is this follow-up Slack and slide. Now this, I would call sort of intermediate R. This is not something that you would throw at first-year students, unless they're really good, and it's maybe at the end of the, of the course. But if you're sort of armed with a strong cup of coffee, as I am right now, and patient, you can sort of walk through line by line and figure out what it does. It's all still base R with its... Um, um, conventions. And in, certain, in essence, what we're doing is we're generalizing from a single fit that we had on the previous slide, and we're having now several fit objects that are related, fit one, two, and three. So fit one is just an original fit that we start with, which we then use in fit two to, I don't have a pointer there, but that's the from min uh, to max. We're basically using the gridding that came out of the first estimation to to uh, constrain the density estimation in what is fit to. And what is fit to? Well, it's a complete uh, Monte Carlo simulation replication in three lines of code, or, or two if you wish. Replicate just reproduces. It's like a, you know, a for loop on steroids. We, we're doing something 10,000 times. And what we're doing is we're, we're, we're resampling with replacement, and then we're re-estimating the density, having cleverly constrained it to the same grid so that we can reuse it. Now FIT2 is a thing that contains these 10,000 uh, replications. And we're just using old school uh, apply to sweep the quantile function over it to pick up the 2.5 and 97.5 percentiles, store those in FIT3, use that in the plot function to give us a um, y-axis limit. And then the second to last line is um, 
that's something that some of you, just like myself, may have used in the past. It's a really powerful and really awkward function. It's, it fills a polygon and you'd basically have to give it the set of coordinates defining the polygon in a, in a very peculiar way, which is why we're doing a, a reverse on, the, on, the, uh, on some of the objects. That all has to do just with how polygon works, but the net effect is this. You know, we, we only needed three lines of code to have a bimodal density estimated from these uh, from this eruption waiting time data from, uh, from that national park in the States. And what we're having now is for something that's not analytically tractable by means of simulations, we've, we've given ourselves you know, probability coverage from 2.5% to 97.5% um, on a screen full of code. And that's, that's pretty cool because R is, after all, a programming language by statisticians for statisticians that allows us to work interactively, plot our data, examine our data, visualize our data, retrieve, generate, gen generate data by means of simulations as we've just done, and excels also at summarizing and reporting into PDF, HTML. So if you're in a setting where you have to produce output and hand it to other people, it's, it's, a, it's a really excellent tool for that. Uh, everything starting from what we had with Swift to PDF to now what we have with, with Shiny and Knitter and all of those things. So that's, that's why we really like it as a language of system computing and for, for data analysis. That's why we're all here for the for this conference. So, but suppose you wanted to go beyond that. Well, where could you go? Um, this sort of leans a bit on the description that it's in the manuals that comes with our writing our extensions, um, because it, not with equal weight, but after all mentions four different programming languages. There's of course C in there because R itself is written in C, and there's Fortran in there because some of the older, very well tested, very well refined numerical routines may be in Fortran. There's Java in there because Java was 20 years ago the next, the next big thing that was going to save us all. Um, so our core member Simon Urbanek uh, wrote a Java interface and it was for a time the most widely used foreign language interface from R. It's just then things happened with Java, the world changed and whatever, so you know, it hasn't become the most common um, extension. But, but su such is life. I mean, it's still there and has its, has its advantages. And because there is a C interface, there always was a C++ interface. So I, you know, I've been around R and CRAN for such a long time that I remembered sort of a particular subdirectory. It's not the directory of the packages, but there is a, I think it's a directory from 2000, where Kurt Honig himself puts together a mini package and puts just a, and he's not a C++ programmer, right? They're, they're, these, these R core people are all really diehard C fans, and, and, and for a reason, because it, it served them, them well. But because R does C, you can always do C++ because that's sort of the key, and I'll come back to that later. A C interface is sort of, is, is your universal sort of entry point to any other language. Any other language that you would bind will mimic a C interface and allow you to talk to that. I mean, that's, that's basically how you talk to Julia or any other language you would you'd fancy. So we always had these four. So in theory, it was always possible to extend R, and people had done that, but it was tedious. And, you know, I used to have other slides and examples with the way that that was done, but, but I moved those, moved those out. So then, 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 you know, back to R and, and where we are with that. Um, I quite like situating the evolution of R back to the um, books that John Chambers, who was very much at the core and center of it. He's not the, the, the single author, but sort of pretty close to it, so you can really call him the father of R. There was one in 76, which is the dark blue one. Um, and I'll come to that in just a second. Then, then there was actually one, um, and it happens to the best of them, um, there was one version that was out that's a brown book, and then they later realized that actually didn't work so well, and that pretty much got pulled. I'd forgotten about that, and Pat Burns pointed that out to me when I had this slide in, in London at, a, at another presentation. So I think that may have, I think that was early 80s, but you see sort of at the bottom, 77, 88, then a short leap, 92, 98, 2008. There's sort of a bit, uh, a, book, uh, a book a decade. Um, but yes, so the, the blue one about the new S language, replacing the brown one, sort of introduced R, which became S. The, the white one at the top right is, was, was very important. That inf introduced uh, LM, tilde notation, a lot of other things. The green one introduced S4, where everybody thought that would, would be the sort of be all, end all, and a lot of people, you know, lean heavily on it, Bioconductor and others, but not everybody. So it, it you know, doesn't solve, didn't solve all problems. The, um, in the second row in the middle, the blue and yellow one, is the first one where R is actually in the title. By then, um, John had become a member of R Core, and now the 
you know, statistical programming, programming with data is explicitly what R no longer, longer is. And then, you know, after I started having these with five in the slides, the, 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 the six came two years ago, and that was pretty important too, and I'll talk about that quite in, in, in a bit. So, um, but the, the blue and yellow one, software for data analysis, reviews a lot sort of of the history of, of, of the S language and R and the Y and how. It's a really, really good book. Um, while I'm pretty old, I'm not that old. That was actually the first one that I read fully of all those other ones. And it gave me, and that was after I had dabbled with R for a decade, I guess. And I found that really eye-opening. It's pretty, it's, it's pretty good. And towards the end, the last two chapters are on interfaces. So the interfaces Roman 1 and Roman 2, chapters 11 and 12. And this line always stuck sort of with me, situating what we're going to do. Um, because R is written in C, um, unsurprisingly, the most direct extension from R is C or call it code from C. So, but you have to do this with C code and that, and I'll highlight that then on the next page, you know, there be dragons. Because we've all heard these stories, oh my God, C programming, memory, pointers, it's really, it's really involved. It actually sort of is to some extent, as are the macros that, that, that our interface uh, offers. It's all very doable, but I find it a bit more cumbersome. And the nice thing about RCPP is that it helped us streamline all of that a very great deal. Um, in that same discussion, he then sort of sums things up, and because it's currently um, the Soccer World Cup, I always sum that up so as a soccer score. And here you would see if you, know, if you, if you weight every bullet point uh, by the same amount, it's sort of four to three against. But you know, you know how this movie ends because I will keep talking for another two and a half hours. So we're actually in favor and not against. Um, and the deal, and that's really those three things. So in the beginning, I was sort of a bit shy and muted about that and, and sort of thought I had to justify speed along with other things that sort of justify, that's bullshit. I mean, the other stuff really matters too, but I mean, if you're really into this just to make your code faster, I work the same way. I mean, there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, the new things matters because sometimes we use this. I actually have, have done that out of curiosity. This is how a lot of this started. Often you get external libraries in a different language and you just want to bring them to R. So you want to build a C uh, constructed interface to another language. So that, that's fine. Um, and then, you know, because you're at the C level, you can also work with references to objects, uh, you know, R6, ICP modules, sort of various things. But, the, the speed thing really is, is the main thing. Um, <clears throat> this one was awesome. So um, John became a fan of this relatively early on and contributed a few things too. And there was uh, maybe in 2010 or 2011 at the end of a Google Summer of Code, Google usually invites two people from each participating organization to, um, to the campus there. And at the time I was looking after the R projects involved in this. Google Summer of Code and could go because the, the timing makes it such that, you know, some people are already at teaching or whatever couldn't go. So I went and John had just, it was around the time that he had, as he's retired, you now they had relocated from, from New Jersey and Bell Labs and that area to Stanford, where the, where's the guest professor or whatever the official title is. And he had just given a talk a week before we were there. And then we was in that sense, in that week, Roman and, 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 and myself at, at, at Google. And uh, he had showed this in, uh, in that talk and then said some really nice things about, about RCPP. I'll get to that in just a second. But this is, this is basically a conceptual drawing uh, notes from a meeting that they had in the May of 76. Um, Bell Labs um, was a very well endowed, uh, very rich uh, research arm of the phone monopolist that was making money left, right and center because, well, they were the phone monopolist. Uh, context again. Um, you know, even I learned about that when I was still living in Europe. The Reagan administration disallowed AT&T to get into sort of computing and software distribution in the, in the 80s because they were already so monopolistic in, um, in communications, in, in, in phones. So that is sort of, you know, that has repercussions about how Unix got distributed and that, you know, AT&T never, never milked the S. Anyway, but so think of them a little bit of a 40 years ago version of what is now Google AI or Google Brain or something. They had really smart people, a lot of money, lots of resources. So we were thinking about a new statistical computing paradigm, how to do something with things. And in 76, computing basically was when you needed an answer from something, you wrote a Fortran program, and then you had to cumbersomely interface that Fortran program, maybe get your data in and out uh, of that in, in certain ways. So what this was about was basically taking what is described here as ABC in the circle, an existing Fortran routine, and writing a shell around it. 
an X ABC to access ABC. And then some of the other details are about, you know, how you would do I.O. basically or have, have interfaces. And, and anyway, so long and short of it is that um, they were thinking about having convenient high level access to trusted underlying computations for an analyst. And then John sort of said that RCPP really comes closest to implementing that vision 40 years later. And that was sort of immensely flattering. And I hope to get to some examples that, that, that allude a little bit to this. But so, you know, that's why we're sitting in the sweet spot. We want to work with R because we get access to already performant code that is, that is in R that is compiled, uh, that's very well tested, um, so we can trust the results and it's also performant. But it's also interpreted code, it's a high level language, a language that allows us to do tricks on the language itself. It's super expressive, people can build the craziest things with it, can do it and we can do rapid prototyping, research, and experimentation. It really, it sort of, it fits the bill really, really well. But we want to extend it. So then the next question is, once we've accepted that, yeah, you know, we want to go beyond, that, that can be done, there's a 40-year-old vision to that, why would we go to C++? And over the years that I updated these slides, I, I, the first one I haven't really updated, but every now and then if you just, in the, in the Google search bar, ask sort of why C++, or why would I use C++, the number of hits sort of keeps changing. Sometimes it's 30 million, sometimes it's 50 million, so they, they seem to be um, curating their, their answers at every now and then. But there's a couple of sort of really dry answers that you can pull from that. Wikipedia, as always, is, is sort of, uh, is, is, is right, if a little hard to read. Statically typed, free-form, multi-paradigm, compiled, general-purpose, powerful programming language. It's all true. So um, there's types in there, which in R we don't have. That's the difference between dynamically typed and statically typed. Free form meaning that you don't have to have a particular rigid layout as in sort of Fortran 6077 with the six column thing. Multi paradigms used for multiple things. It's compiled. General purpose again, you know, sort of for anything, not, not domain specific, powerful programming language. And yeah, it's industrial strength. It's vendor independent. It's not beholden by anyone. Uh, very widely used. And the nice thing now is still evolving. After sort of this threat from Java and later C Sharp, it um, uh, it rebooted. Um, the standard committee meetings now are much more active than they used to be. It follows us sort of a bit from a distance. I mean, I'm, I'm much more an R user uh, or much more knowledgeable R about C++, but I, but I use C++, so I follow that a little. So that's, it's really good to see. And yes, in, in science and research, it's pretty dominant too. Uh, of course, you can always have religious wars with other people who always say, oh, well, for numerics, Fortran is faster, blah, blah, blah. It really sort of all depends, and people have uh, settled or unsettled um, endless debates with, with benchmarks and what have you, but it is, it is very clearly uh, very competitive and one of the very fastest, if not the fastest. I mean, it's sort of, there's, there's no total dominance from one, but it's, 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 it's up there. There's no good reason not to use it. And because it's been around, there's tooling, debuggers, profilers, whatever. So, <clears throat> and yeah, so how would you then go about it? Um, there's Scott Myers is an, is an author in this space, author and consultant, and he has a couple of um, very successful books with um, Alison Wesley, I think, he, Prentice Hall, I keep forgetting. I think he also just changed publisher, but uh, one very uh, influential one was um, um, Efficiency Builders, I think it's called, yeah, that, uh, where the first edition had 50 individual stories items, sort of two pages to three pages long, that detail a particular aspect. But it's really, really readable. It's also very, very well written. And basically, the very first one is this point. Why C++ and what is C++? And he offers a very unique view. When I read that, I'd already used it, sort of self-taught for 15, 20 years. He basically explains that it's four different distinct languages that don't really overlap. And you, the, the very exciting thing about it is that and that, that sort of I knew is that you don't have to use all of them. I had joked as a grad student, I had sort of been instructed in C and then taught myself C++ from that in all those years that I was always using C++. So I was basically still thinking as a C programmer and I was just selectively pulling certain idioms from C++ over, but oh my God, it's such a complicated language, but it means I wasn't using all of them. And that's actually super legit because the first point really is, and you know, Hair splitting pedantic computer scientists will then point out to you, no, no, there are C programs that would not compile as C programs. Yes, about three in a billion. I mean, but for all intents and purposes, a C program is also a C program, which worked wonders for the adoption of this. Um, 
Then it defined a particular notion of object orientation in sort of the following through from small talk and some other things. It's, don't want to discuss this endlessly because it's also different from what we do in, in R, but that's a, that's a second and really important aspect. Um, then the third one is something that's super unique to it. It allows templated programming, and with templated programming, template metaprogramming, so you can defer some computation that you otherwise would only have at the runtime when your data comes in to the compile time. Sounds like magic is magic. It's also not comprehensible by humans, with uh, very few exceptions. Um, Romain got very good at it, and a lot of the magic in RCPP uh, does basically that, so it's, it's, it's metaprogramming. Then a thing that used to be outside of actually, um, I think that started as an HP subdivision, sort of a, a basically a, a library got added with, with standard features, and that goes by STLs and entertainment library. And it's sort of close to official now, but I think very technically not, but that, that doesn't matter. It is everywhere now. When I started with these things in the 90s, it wasn't everywhere, and certain vendors then started bringing certain pieces in, but not others, so that was a really painful long transition, but now it's there. And then I sort of got creative and added a fifth point, because when Maya wrote the original uh, four, C++ 11 and 14 and 17, whatever, weren't there, but that's, uh, that, that brings sort of yet another dimension to the language, and that's also, also opt-in, so it really fits this framework very well. So C++ is great, it's mature, it's, it's, it has a good focus. People sometimes say it's important because of these things too. Um, you get very good performance per energy unit cons consumed. It's not like Java or C Sharp that there's a virtual machine in between, um, um, sort of virtual abstract machine layer. It goes sort of straight through. Um, from the previous slide with these five different menu items that you can pick from, things that you don't select, you don't pay for. So there's no, there's no overhead in the compiled code that you're getting. Sort of all those things are pretty, pretty nice. The third point I hope to convince you of a little bit later with examples, it's also super abstract and high level. We sort of really like to think about certain operations because we got used to them in R. You know, if I have an object X that's a vector of 100 elements, sum X is sort of natural. That's how I want to get the sum. I don't want to go in and kind of say, well, for I equals to zero, while I is less than 99, pick element I, add it to the sum. You know, we, and, and, and those are things that you can do thanks to the uh, OO-ness. So it, you know, it lets you do functional programming, extra programming as well. So it's, it's a really big range. And there's certainly complexities and devils and details, um, but you're mostly shielded. Mostly. You know, you forget a semicolon somewhere and error messages come back and they're indecipherable and you get frustrated, but you know, that's, that's the price you gotta pay. So that's, otherwise it's not so bad. So, yeah, so back to that. I, I'd shown that. That was the blue and yellow book, interfaces one and two. Um, that led to this one then, um, extending R, and sort of that's, that's kind of neat because that stole a tagline which I've used for a couple of years for, for presentations motivating RCPP because I, I saw it the same way ab about this. Um, and John sort of basically went one further from these two final chapters in the blue and yellow book and wrote that entire book about it, and it's, it's awesome. Uh, he was kind, he sent me sort of near ready preprints, so I think I had two passes over it before it was published. Um, the shortcut for this is XR. He has a package on CRAN called XR that provides inter, um, infrastructure, and then two usage packages. Um, is it XR? Maybe it's X, X Python and X Julia, basically showing how this works. So he, he basically in the book discusses sort of three different approaches in the small, medium, and large, three different ways to get from one system to another system. Basically, you can, uh, yeah, and, and uh, he mentions uh, C++ and RCPP, of course, favorably there and puts it, puts it in there as well, but because we're already there, he doesn't, um, he doesn't develop yet another framework for it, so it's, 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 it's pretty neat. And um, um, the blue and yellow book stresses two points that have sort of entered the conversation. You, you may have heard them in context uh, uh, about R or, or sometimes quoted. So he talks about the mission and the, uh, the imperative in there. Sort of the, 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 the mission is to, you know, we're, we're, we're research statisticians, even as applied statisticians, and it's, it's about to do new things in statistical computing that people haven't done, but they have to be trustworthy. So that was sort of a really, really big deal. Um, Actually, I had that wrong. Those, those ones are not that well known. The first two points that he, that he opens with here 
are well known and have been heard. Sort of that basically, whenever we do something in R, everything that we're getting back is an object. Everything can be modified. I mean, even um, and uh, everything that everything that changes something in R, everything that happens is implemented a function call. Even you know the less than minus assignment operator really is a function call behind the scenes. So those two bullet points, everybody sort of agreed with and, and was um, accepted as a as sort of a standard. And what's really new in this book and came out of nowhere is that John sort of then decrees that, yes, interfaces are standard part of R. And, you know, elevates that sort of to the same level of, 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 of truth and truism as everything that ha exists in R is, is an object. So this thing about if other, if other software solutions exist somewhere, it really behooves us to to interface to them and milk them rather than go about and replicating them and redoing them because that's that's just not a smart way to go about it because if you redo it, you know, you may just reinvent new bugs and what have you. Which is not to say that building interfaces is trivial and a lot of a book then goes about what would you do at which level. Um, and I think I stole one quote from that here exactly that if you do that in the large, you need a particularly broad and flexible response or for a software system in large, it, it may not be addressable in a single um, language and implementation. That's sort of a contentious statement because Python people, for example, are very proud of their language, what it has accomplished and often tell us that, yep, it's the one language for sort of all things. But, you know, it's a trade-off. There's, there's a lot that you can do in one language, but sometimes Sometimes you, you know, you get further by mix and match. So, but interfacing multiple systems is the essence and then part Roman four sort of goes into that. And, and that's basically where we're at with this. Um, RCPP allows you to do that, to extend R, to go to other things and then expand something. So really quickly over this, this is what I threw in a year or two ago. Some of these are really old. You see there's a bottom from 2012. Um, that is a um, support service for uh, social sciences at Harvard. I think by now they have a different name and hence a different um, um, Twitter handle, but that was basically the thing that, you know, with RCPP, we get to leverage the speed of C++ with the ease and clarity of, of, of R. It's a pretty, pretty awesome compliment, which is why I kept that. Um, Peter Hickey is from around here and kind of just said, holy cow, you know, each time I do something with RCPP, it's holy shit, that's fast. That's the point. Um, um, similar sentiments of, you know, when I did something like that based on RCP and the, the write-up in Hadley's book, uh, 750X, very nice. Another Australian saying sort of just, you know, how much time RCP saves. Um, Roman quoting Hadley from a keynote at the Earl conference that RCP is one of the three things that changed how he writes code. Um, famous bioinformatics, biostats prof saying sort of that he's also very happy with RCP and same with... Uh, with Bob Rudis. Um, this is Colin uh, retweeting a chart that's in his O'Reilly book about efficient R programming. So that's pretty flattering. It's, uh, he's a real statistician, so that's on a log scale. So the, the differences are actually you know, larger than what you see here because you have exponentiated out. And you really see that you know, RCPP now dominates Java by, by some orders of magnitude. And at that point in time, everything else was still a run up. I would expect this to change dramatically now because we have reticulate, which is sort of the bee's knees too, uh, because we can just leverage what exists in Python. There's a lot of RCPP, of course, in reticulate as well, and it's JJ, but uh, I would expect us to see a lot more uh, of that. Uh, but by the same token, so R Python was basically the standard interface from R to Python and is used by John in this XR Python package. Uh, or was um, in the version reference in the book or when the book came out and he changed that over to reticulate as well. So that's, that's kind of good to have. Uh, Gabor Zadi, when he was presenting the R hub, uh, was just, you know, using R hub to debug something was just kind of saying it's much easier to get something wrong when we're not using RCPP, which is sort of an indirect compliment. And that was just a week or two ago where someone, you know, had some spare time and was amusing himself. That's GitHub stars on the bottom. So some packages, you know, get a lot of social media attention. And on the, on the y-axis, um, we have actual downloads from that sort of common data set from the RStudio-owned uh, grand mirrors. And that has RCVP quite up there on top with <coughs> relatively few GitHub stars. And then he's very kind too and kind of calls us an, an unsung hero. So, you know, summing up, why RCVP? Why do we do this? 
it's easy enough to learn. Um, we've, we've shielded away a lot of uh, the deployment um, setup things, um, largely thanks to R, um, because it allows us to do that. We've done some clever things so that you get vectorized C++. You get access to all underlying R objects. That's sort of really important. Not only sort of, you know, your vector of data, your matrix, your list, but also more complicated things, functions, environments, S3, S4, makes things faster, and you can extend. And this I update every now and then, and then I had some spare time yesterday, so that was just from yesterday. I sort of love this chart, and, and over the years, so the... Um, it's total number of CRAN packages using RCPP on the left, um, which of course got completely mind-boggling. On the right is percentage of CRAN, and there, there are two lines, because when I started putting this chart together, maybe in 2012 or 13, they were actually hugging each other, and they sort of changed a little, and there's sort of funny things happening with the slope, because when you can see for that light blue one, definitely the slope increased in 2014, and, and we, we were increasing pretty rapidly adoption within with an R package, and you see there at the top, that, that flattened about a year ago. So it's still, it's still growing. We're about to become, hit sort of 11%, but something happened there. And also, what you can see in the dark blue line, it gets very ragged there, because CRAN seems to have gotten more rigid of late and um, pushes packages back, so the total number actually is not monotonically increasing. Quite the, you know, you see the zigs there every now and then, packages get pushed out, and that happens quite a bit this, this spring. So the growth there slowed a little, but the, the last few weeks were pretty active again. So 1395 as of yesterday, which is just kind of wow. Um, when I started making these counts, we had sort of 10 or 20 packages using it, and uh, our Java had 60. And my goal in life basically was, wouldn't it be awesome if we caught up with our Java, you know, get to 60, allow it to have some growth too. Maybe we catch it when it's at 80. It's at, I don't know, 100, 120 now, and we have 10 times X. It's, com it's, it's insane. But it, 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 we got lucky. I mean, we hit a speed spot, and the thing sort of works pretty well. Um, this is from a presentation, Andre de Vries, who was at uh, Revolution and the Microsoft and is now um, at our studio, did a couple of years ago. Um, he re-implemented the PageRank algorithm. That's, that's you know, basically the math behind Google's ranking to, get, to quantify these networking effects. And it turns out that um, that's the dot plot that I've been made of that, that, that um, RCPP is sort of number one by quite a margin. And that uh, surprised me quite a bit. I wasn't quite expecting that. The plot's kind of cute now because now the next ones up always seem to be pairs between base R and something from Headley, which is really adorable. <laughs> I mean, sort of, it's MASS and ggplot because clearly Brian Ripley and Headley are, you know, siblings, as we know. And then dplyr and matrix, so it's, it's, it's kind of funny. MET norm is, is, is Torsten and Zurich and plyr. Um, our RCP Amadeo is in there, really, really high level up, so it's, it's, it's kind of neat. But this thing sort of changes. I, I put about 30 on the, on the screen because then it's still, still readable. One can look a little longer. There's a lot of new packages in there, and they, they're clearly bubbling up, so this, this stuff evolves. And, and um, <laughs> I'm not so sure about the units and the differences of, of units, but it's, yeah, that, that, there's a gap. But that just has to do with the fact that we're really also an infrastructure package that you can use to do stuff, and then many people did, and because of that, we're sort of somewhat central in the node. Um, R2, R34 uh, gave us a new function that we didn't have before that I, that I quite like, because this was a question that I had that I'd pondered for a while and can now answer. So, you know, I can, of course, count how many packages there are on CRAN. It's the high 12,000s now. How many use RCPP? 1395. So I get that percentage. But that's really not the percentage that I'm interested in because I also would like to know how many packages on CRAN actually use compiled code because there's a lot of sensible things that we can do without going to compiled code. And most of us only have sort of, you know, gut feel about what this proportion is. And now we can calculate that because if you, if you invoke tools, colon, colon, CRAN, package DB, it goes back and gets you a, I keep forgetting, a matrix or a data frame of all packages times 65 columns. And those contain fields that you can use to compute things with. So here I can just count how many depend on RCPP. That's how I get my 1395. These days, there used to be a longer form way to calculate that. And I can also sum up how many of them use the combination, um, which apparently is... Um, 3,200. And then if I calculate the proportion of that, it means I'm currently at about 42% of packages with compiled code using RCPP. 
That's pretty impressive too. So I'm, I'm quite stunned by that because it clearly, I mean, as I said at the beginning, extending R was always possible. So there's older packages there, and it's still possible to do without us. So people, for good reason, choose not to use it. But we are basically in more than two out of five of those who use compiled code. So with that, all that warming up, how does that get used? And that gets us in a moment to your first exercise. Um, there used to be a much more complicated way of doing things, and we had that, um, and that already helped and made things popular. And then JJ basically single-handedly um, wrote an extension package uh, that ships with RCPP that we call now RCPP attributes that made it much easier to, um, to deploy RCPP. Sadly, that happened right around the time that I finished the RCPP book. So it mostly talks about the older form and not the new form. So I've been meaning to rewrite that for five years now. But there's essentially three functions. And the first one of which, which was in the email that I sent you, which I want you to try in just a second, is basically after you've loaded RCVP, or if you prefix, um, oops, hold on. Um, so you can actually see it. Please shout when it's visible because right now it's obviously not. Do I need that? Two, one more? Good, good enough? Or should I? One more? Like this? Yeah. 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 So the simplest way then really is when you do library RCVP and the computer comes back not screaming, so you actually have it. The simplest litmus test is take an expression, and we really just have that here as a. Um, as a test of do things work. And what happens now is, and you see that you know, my laptop is kind of, uh, do I really have to? I mean, it doesn't immediately come back. And um, I think these all have options. You can actually ask it. And I think if I don't change the expression, then it's clever enough to know that you know, it can use the cache values. So and now let me take 6.5, yeah. And this is basically what's happening. And that's why this is easier to use. Back in the old days, I mean, I, I gave entire tutorials about that explaining sort of all this nonsense that you had to put up there. So in essence, eval CPP is a code generator. It, it builds a lot of stuff behind the scenes, but it allows us to test if that, if that works. And with that, and I hear you all sort of furiously typing away, which is fantastic. Um, let me just make one more point on the, so that, that's, you know, so. Two plus two, obviously, um, I do have a PhD in econ math, so I can assure you it is four, and the computer <laughs> agrees. Um, but you can use it to pick up other things. The next line is sort of, you know, where C++ really easily uh, and quickly degenerates into a foreign language. That basically invokes out of the STD library from the header file numeric limits uh, and that's templated then, uh, conditioned on that we want it for a double, colon, colon, max. So that's, um, we have that in R as well under, I think, dot machine, double, dollar, max, or something like that. That on a 64-bit computer basically says what's the max of your double. And of course, it's the same because they all use the same representation. So you can pick those things up with eval CPP as well, but, but mostly it's just for the simple stuff. So that basically gets us exercise one. Just get this aha effect of, um, you know, being able to tell your mom, yes, I compiled C++ code with R. <laughs> and uh, Mitchell is hiding away in the corner, but he is here and designated to help anybody who's lost. And I can do that too. And we have this done not quite strategically before corner, before, before break, but we will have another one of those. If your computer has sort of the measles, uh, we, we, we can help. Talk to us. We've been there. They always get the measles, trust me. So, um, thumbs up, worked for most folks? Good, yeah. Um, and then sort of the next one, which is almost as easy, and I just copy and pasted quickly one here with an extended feature which we don't immediately need, is generates, generalizes this concept of eval CPV by one level, because what did eval CPV do? We gave it a constant string no interpolation, no things happening, and it just embedded the string in some other stuff. And here, basically, we're doing the same, but we're going one further. We're building a string, or we're passing along a string that contains a complete function. 
And a function in C++, for all intents and purposes, is close enough to a function in R. It will return something, so there's something on the left, and because it's a typed language, we have to tell that. So here I'm saying int something or other. So this function will compute an integer and return it. Then I have the function name, the identifier, that's sort of similar to R, and I call this example C++11. And the parents uh, are used to denote the function interface and the arguments, optional arguments therein. Here it doesn't have any. And the curlies um, describe the beginning and end of the function. This shows a particular trick of how instead of default C++ standard 2003, the normal standard, or C++ 98, but let's not get there, uh, you can turn on C++ 11, which, you know, on fresher new operating system is a default anyway, but we need this for a couple of years. And the trick in here is this auto declaration, I'll get to that later. Basically all detail, what we really want from this slide is, aha, uh -huh, if we do that, let me, let me hop out and do that live and in color too, because there's nothing as gratifying as seeing your instructor stumble and fall over <laughs> when he mistypes. Um, so let me do that without the, the plugin thing. So a function that I often use then simpler is just, you know, double me, something, something really numerically sophisticated. Um, it's definitely grad school material. We are taking an argument and we're going to return twice that argument. Believe me, this is science. Um, so here it's now it's just a one-liner, and because I'm live in our studio rather than pen docked, um, it, um, it's not green, right? I mean, the, on, on some other editors it would be. But what, what sort of has happened in, you know, the awesomeness of studio fully to the rescue, what has now appeared in my otherwise empty global environment? I passed this string to CPP function, and CPP's function's task is to take this string and just, uh, let me make this one bigger, and just how eval CPP did sort of some magic to make a program around it. Um, CPP function does the same thing. So it, it, it puts the other glue that one needs around it out, and we now have what our studio calls a function by the name double me that does something that has a single argument x. Well, isn't that peculiar? Because that's exactly what we'd written in the string. So the CPP function thing is actually is super neat. We're, we're basically doing some, you know, regexing string parsing and figuring out, well, what is the identifier I was called with uh, and tasked to generate to be callable as the process function? And that's the one that's assigned. And that's what's happening here. So we now have an R function double me calling this C++ function double me. Obviously, there's some other renaming behind the scenes, but because when we have this, if I then take double me of 21, I get, as expected, the answer to all things back. And um, that's pretty neat, too. And what we just saw on the slide is here, you can have other arguments, dispatch the things, make sure you need other packages or whatever, but that's, that's slightly more advanced usage. This is sort of just the beginning. And with that, because the previous exercise worked so great, we will get to another exercise that's um, a little bit more involved. Um, try, this mostly works, of course, if you know a little bit of C or C++, know how a, how a for loop works or something like that. I'll give you a hint in just a second. I mean, if you've never seen C++, don't despair. I mean, I'm not expecting you to, to invent this now, but but write something that sums the element of an integer vector and returns the sum back. So you can call it with vec sum 1 to 10. And I have one more slide here with the hints. Two things that you may need if you compute a running sum of the elements of, an, of, an, uh, of, of a vector is you probably want a helper variable that carries the current sum. And you need to know, and I haven't told you that yet, hence the hint, how to actually figure out how many elements there are in a vector. And that's sort of the nice thing here with, um, with o owners. Here we're saying in the interface, yep, vec sum will get called by an integer vector, which we call v. We can then interrogate v dot size. v dot length, I think, also exists. We were sort of generous in putting several identifiers in because some people want the one, some people want the other. And it will tell you on a vector of 10 elements, it will assign 10 to, 10 to n. And let me just give you maybe a minute um, to try this. And if you're stuck, sort of don't despair. I'll just walk, walk through the... Uh
example in a second, or, or maybe sort of half a minute and I'll start um, typing it in. And again, there's no, there's no crazy or unqualified questions. If you have a question, we have a break now. Um, sort of us, we're here. If you need, if you need machine assistance, Fleck, Mitchell, or myself, over. For really short things, because it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's not really convenient. But I get to a richer expression. But, but this is sort of super powerful. So some people get so uh, mesmerized with that, they never move beyond. I think that's wrong. I mean, because you, there's no limit, right? I mean, you can't have a thousand line program as a single string. It's just editing that becomes a little cu cumbersome. So you, you could, I generally don't would, but three liners, four liners, quit ad hoc exercises at the prompt for that, it's perfect. Um, I, I get to the next one. Then we have a, we have a that, that's the third function. We'll, we'll get there in just a second. So let me see. I have sort of a proposed solution on the next slide, but why don't I? Um, try this here too. Um, And I'm not claiming that this is a super easy example um, because there's a couple of things in here that you, that, that you need to know, but I'll just walk through those in just a second with you. And, you know, to the question just now, I mean, there's, there's limits to how useful doing it all in one line is because I can't probably indent here and do other things. But this should be... Even doing, I'm doing this on the podium and under praying eyes uh, should be approximately correct. And of course it's not because, yep, I was talking about N, but I hadn't actually used it, so let's just do, so here I'm doing without, just doing this on the fly. But yep, thank you for catching that. This, um, the analysis of these error messages actually got much better over the years. Um, and our studio is also particularly good about that because they put logic in. I mean, they just put the cursor right there and then other things. But now, back some. And as memory serves, this should give me 55. Very good. So, um, who's gotten there? So, who self ah, experienced programmers? Hey, what are you doing here? So, but now, co congrats. <laughs> Very good. So, uh, what I had here as the... Let's just walk through the... Um, what I had here is the proposed solution. So basically, this is the, the most pedestrian way that you can do it. This is just, and that's, that's perfect. There's no shame in this. Uh, I, I'm really puzzled by all this stuff now coming from our studio that, oh, you shouldn't write four functions. You shouldn't write four loops. Use per. And that's just bullshit. I mean, just, <laughs> I mean, I learned programming as a teenager. I've, you know, I've, I don't know, I've used for loop as long as I've been riding bicycles, give or take. So I mean, it's just, <laughs> it, it, you know, why stop doing something that works? That's all mental model. Anyway, um, and, and the, the, anyway, functional programming is cool. Per is cool too, but um, you know, you, you think about the solution in a for loop anyway. But so we need something to sum things up. So here I called it S. Uh, we need to know when to stop. So here I assign V size to N, and then the basics of a for loop in both C and C++ looks exactly that way. Has always been that way. You can declare the variable that you need inside the round. The parents before the first semicolon. So this says we want an integer variable that we name i and that starts at zero. Then the loop will run whenever the second component remains true. And the trick here is its indexing is different from what we have in R. Things start at zero, not at one. So our terminating condition is not equal to n, it's less than n. That's just, you know, we all get it wrong all the time. Uh, but that's just something that you have to get used to. And when you're translating code from one or the other, you always have to shift one. That's just the way it is. But that's the mechanic of our loops. Our running sum then is super simple. We're just, each time we're traversing the loop, we're adding the current element V 
index i to s, and then we're returning s. And, um, and um, because I'm really a meanie, let me just show you how, um, how we can do this thanks to the stuff in, uh, in RCPP as well. <coughs> Because we and I'll get to that. We have these operators. So screw assigning S as a helper, screw interrogating um, N for the size, screw having a loop. So you know, sort of screw per. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, no, I mean it's the same motivation. I mean essentially. We really like higher level functions, and um, that is another colossal Romain contribution to this all. We, he called this sugar. We have a boatload of functions that uh, not only resemble, but basically re-implement their equivalence in R. There's, there's hundreds of them. It's a bit hard to document, but if you want the sum of a vector V, well, you just call sum of vector V. And that's what makes RCVP really cool, because your pure C++ colleagues can't necessarily do that. It's not entirely true. That's the fourth point of Maya, STL, and whatever. They have, they have things for that as well. They tend to have really, um, really weird names. Um, so you would use aggregate. Okay, then. Um, but of course, of course these, these, these things exist. And, and that's sort of a really nice way out. Um, yep. And then to the question of, you know, how do I do this a bit more at the large? Because... Lots of people see CPP function kind of go, well, this is fantastic. That's all I ever need. Just how, and those are those very people, and you know them, I know them too. Those are those people whose code is always source file A, source file B, source file C, who never migrated to packages, and likewise, they never migrated to source CPP, then they would have CPP function each and every call. You don't want to do it that way because then you, you basically have the burden of recompiling each and every time. Uh, also, the short snip is just good enough. So one better is source CPP. Just how eval CPP is the cousin of eval. Source CPP is the cousin of source. It takes an entire file um, and then does things to it. And that allows you to define multiple functions, define helper functions that are there that you may not want to export and sort of do, do other things. Uh, this really is the core of attributes. It builds on something that Roman and I had hacked together around a package called Inline, uh, which had borrowed an idea, I think we'd first seen in Perl or some other languages, which is basically this very same idea that you have a program in another language, they're defined in a string, and you just want to pass it down, and Inline, Inline did this. So um, I think it was called Inline for Perl as well. And uh, a fellow who at the time was at the European Bioinformatics Center uh, did this for R, and then I quite liked that, used that, and we put some wrapping around to use it with RCPP. That was the CXX function, but now we have source CPP. And it's, it's much better. And you can use it with plugins and other stuff. So most of the examples that I show you, you know, if you experiment with them, you will use via source CPP. How does that get used? So this essentially is a shortened version of a, of a live example. I'll just show you in a second. So this, this now <coughs> gives us basically a little bit more um, content and structure of a full C++ program that we hadn't seen before because eval CPP and uh, source and CPP functions were these you know, code generators in code and put other things around. Um, basically, every file that you write in C++ and C will, um, to the gentleman in the back, we have plenty of seats up here in the front, so don't, don't feel shy and you know, by all means walk, walk through now and there's, there's plugs here. Then you can be on it. Actually, two rows. Um, uh, so these things. Actually, that's an interesting mistake. I, so obviously, I have a, I have a copy and pasty in there um, because I don't need to include RCVB H twice. So um, imagine, imagine you only see one, uh, and it's not, it's not the beer from yesterday. Um, the include basically brings in a header file. Header files have declarations. Declarations tell the compiler what it can assume to be known, hence what uh, variables, functions, things you can, you, can, uh, you can reference. And if you're using RCPP, you need that to bring the RCPP functionality in. Using namespace RCPP is a convenient shortcut for small usage. 
This is, this is uh, its namespaces. It's very related to what we have in R with the notion of two colons and three colons and what we do in the namespace file with importing. Um, there's sort of a trade-off between being, being lazy that you don't have to prefix things and being precise where you prefix things and know exactly where you were getting them from. Uh, if you've ever come across this um, misfeature really uh, that dplyr really finds lag and filter. So if you had lag from the stats package or filter from the stats package and you load dplyr, then dplyr sits in front and if you call it, you get that and things break. Whereas if you're of course called stats dot dot uh, colon colon lag, you're still explicit about that. So general recommendation for sort of real industrial strings code is to not do using namespace rcpp, but to always prefix when you're using rcpp content, which on this line would be in two places. You would have to prefix the numeric vector that's used there twice with it. We, we, we'll be seeing that. But for small things, usually you're running with this pair. Include RCVP using namespace RCVP just, just as a shorthand. And the next line then is the magic that makes uh, source CPP um, happening. The slash slash is the C++ comment character. So the line that's there is just an ornament, an attribute, which is why we called this attributes. JJ picked on the name because future C++ versions will work more aggressively with attributes, but this is just one that we pick up, and it's a particular regex that um, the RCVP attributes machinery then picks up. When you prefix a function with a comment, with square bracket, square bracket, RCVP export, you're basically saying, this guy, I want an R. So that basically means, bring me this thing in. And that's optional. You can have a C++ function in this file. The file may compile, everything's good, and you still can't run it from R. Well, why is that? Well, it's simple. You will have forgotten to put the export tag there. So the RStudio IDE is actually, let me show that it's actually it's, it's helpful. It's so good that it then tells you, um, hey, you know, I just compiled something for you, but it didn't include an export tag. Are you sure you know what you're doing? And it uses, of course, sort of slightly better language. But the file that I just showed you um, is the demo file you get from here. We also have machinery in the package. Um, anybody know the base R function packet.skeleton? These days, almost esoteric. Yes, no, nobody, one? I, I do. I wrote many packages with it. So it's just it, 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 the, the old recommended way of bootstrap a package. So we wrote additional helpers, um, rcpp.packageskeleton. And this is sort of a variant of it that got baked into our studio. So this is basically the same thing with a bit more comment and um, uh, an advertisement for our website, Headley's book, the RCPP gallery. So I just took that out to make it fit on the screen. And otherwise, it's exactly what I just showed you. And if I now, if I just make this regex kaput and then say source me this, Oh, yeah, so, and that's always the same, uh, because it's a generated temp file. It doesn't have a name yet. If it doesn't have a name, it can't get compiled. Yep, so this is what I just talked about. If you don't have the tag, it's actually so helpful that it tells you, wow, you know, I just compiled something for you, but there was nothing in there that you can use. Did you really mean that? And just, just, that's just indication of a simple error of omission, typically. Whereas if we put it in here, then you see how this works. And there's a bit more magic that I haven't shown you yet, which would I may as well now. There's another meta trick, and this comment talks about that. Um, if you use another style of comment that's really sort of an embedded regex for us, which is the C style comment, and again, we had said C++ encompasses C. So C comments, which start with slash star, all the way, possibly multi-line, until they end with star slash, and the generalized form that we used here is three stars followed by an R. It means feed this R code um, to the session or to, to, to yeah, execute this R code. And what we're doing here is basically we define a function times two that takes a numeric vector. And then we're calling it with a numeric vector, in this case of just one element. And um, let me go back to the, to the other slide. It's a... Uh, it's a really useful, so just on one slide, it looks approximately like this. It's really convenient because you more or less get your code and the test execution um, bundled together and triggered in the same build. 
So when you just source this and make code out of make code out of it, you can immediately test that it that it works. So this is, you know, this is this is the standard way to dabble with things. So this is, you know, this is how you answer a colleague's question or you know someone's request for help on Stack Overflow. What we're doing is we're having a function times two, and then we're invoking it with times two. Let me just hop back one more time, really showing that, uh, that, 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 that uh, if I call it with a uh, um, I think we're an hour in because my phone's no longer snoozing. Hold on. Uh, let me. I should probably just sign out of this sucker. Um, sorry about that. Yeah, let, me, let me just sign out. There. Um, da, 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 times two, because I claim you know works for a vector. So let's just do it with a vector. That's this nice thing about R. Um, there's no real notion of a scalar. So if I call it with one, two, three, the return x times two is also object-oriented. C, the uh, multiplication operator. Um, is overloaded and knows that if applied to a vector, it should apply to every element of the vector. But that's sort of C++ fuzzy details. <coughs> that really just gets us, you know, is the illustration of sort of the third, third, uh, third usage pattern. Evaluate CPP, CPP function, source CPP. And source CPP is, is awesome, exactly. And this is, this is just the slide writing out what I just showed you. You need to, you can get a file like that if you go in our studio into a new C++ file. You've got to save it somewhere. I'm on a Unix system, so it's slash temp. On Windows, it's C temp or whatever you use. Source it from that location, either explicitly or in the IDE, just hitting the button. And then you can invoke it with a test function. Yes? Say that again when I define it where? No, it's, it's, it's available for the other C++ because it becomes a C++ complication unit. So you can have a C++ function and have that called by another function and another function and then the fourth exports. So what separate Blocks. Blocks. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, but, but that's the idea. It's a good point. Um, um, yeah, I think we'll get to an example later. The, the basically, the cooked example for RCPP Amadeo that I'll talk about has multiple in a file. You'll, you'll just see it then. So that's, that's really good. Um, but um, yeah, I don't have this slide here. This is, at this point, I usually get into finger wagging. Sort of source CPP is really good, and you can build your things this way. Don't stop there. The, really, the real way to do it, the fourth way, is doing it as a package. And I think I come back to that as well. Sometimes I have it in the secret right, right after here, because that's, that's really not much harder because the problem with source CPP is it's a bit like just-in-time compilation. Each time you want it, you actually have to sit there and compile it through. And it's really powerful, but there are certain things it will not do. So, for example, a common question that we had, um, any of you ever worked with sort of easy-to-use parallelism, MCL apply or stuff like that, or over a cluster? When you do source CPP, you have a function in your local session here. You do not get that to the slave nodes where you want to execute. I mean, you could but it's a mess. I mean, you could ship the string over, have it compiled there, whereas if you have the code in a package, then you just have the package on your nodes, have it loaded there, and hence your function is there, and you can, anyway, sort of little things. You really do want a package. But I say that to just about every question related to R, so uh, there's nothing new here, so. Um, yeah, another half hour, so let's, let's just hit this one on. So now that we've seen sort of how it works, a bit back to uh, motivation. And basically, these are two old examples. So this was something that I found uh, on the web as well in a blog by Christian Robert, who's a French uh, Paris and at Warwick um, Bayesian. And that was around the time, I think, when Redford Neal first sent some patches up to our core about, well, how is this or that? And it's sort of, it's nice R peculiarism so you know as we're all sort of intermediate to advanced R users we've heard certain things about it so this basically just just it's navel gazing right it tries to figure out okay suppose I want to compute 1 over 1 plus x 
And there are five equivalent ways of computing that. They will all give you the same answer. I mean, we'll know that. Uh, the question just is which ones are cheap and which ones are expensive. And that sort of has to do with, you know, well, you know, it's the language because it's an interpreted language. Is the R parser really optimized enough or not? So, you know, the difference between F and G is that G protects the expression by another, by another pair of parents, which then in computer science lingo gets you to another, you know, branch in the abstract syntax tree and whatever, and that seems to have performance implications. Function H is sort of the most mathematically clear, right? Well, you know, I have one plus X and I want one over, so I exponentiate this. If you've been around computers long enough, then of course you're jaded and you're starting to feel that, oh, this is going to get expensive. I mean, so it's just like calling trigonometric. I mean, it will turn out that H is not the most performing among them. And then it gets sort of cute, right? So what if we delimit context by curlies rather than round ones, which helps the language but is less mathematically and sort of stuff like that. But they're, they're all equivalent and I'm mostly sort of an aw shucks person because as we'll see in three slides, they're basically all the same speed. So here we're just sticking it into the, the, the benchmark code that was on the bottom from the, our benchmark package. And for all intents and purposes, doing this 100 times, you know, on this laptop it takes 400 milliseconds. Yeah, whoop de doo um, Age is a little slower, 30%. Okay. But when I read that, I kind of just went, hmm. Because doing 1 over x, uh, one, 1 over 1 plus x is a near ideal use for CPP function, you know, that sort of fits in a string and we get that right three times editing, not too many syntax errors and eventually it compiles. So this now gets us M. And then the question is, well, how does that compare? And then it's sort of kind of, yeah, all shucks, right? So then it's either six times faster or eight times faster. So that's, that's just the thing. I mean, that's just the difference between an interpreter and a compiler. And with that, I was, I don't think I followed up because, um, as our grandmothers told us, there's no point being rude in public. Um, uh, but it was sort of mostly sort of a comment to myself. Or I shared it with some friends and sort of kind of, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's good to see. And it's good to make these investigations because we want to make the, um, uh, the R interpreter faster and more performant. And, and uh, on, on a real serious side note, I've been doing these slides for a couple of years. So I have old versions of these slides, same web server. And it's the same usage, right? I have our benchmark there, but I haven't rerun the code in a while. So for the same code examples, the delta between what R did and what I got with RCPP has actually shrunk. And that's because R core is actually really awesome. So they poured a lot of work into the interpreter to find all different kernel cases and smoothing it a little. And of course, C++ is still orders of magnitudes faster. It's just slightly fewer orders. And that's actually kind of nice. I mean, R is, is no question R is actually kind of awesome. And, and the other older example is that's what I found years ago, one evening idling at home looking at uh, Stack Overflow, Kit comes in and wants the Fibonacci sequence, if you haven't seen it, you know, f of n such that we return n for argument 0 or 1, or the sum of the two preceding function calls for all other arguments. Um, slay of n, negative values are uh, verboten. Uh, we don't concern ourselves with those. Um, and that one, um, I love this. I mean, that was a great example. I used it as a motivating example and I've bored audiences with this for, you know, close to a decade now. And the intro chapter in the RCBP book goes all over it. And with that, I little, did a little bit of research. I think the ComSci people call this the most analyzed algorithm in the world. And dissertations have been written about it or libraries filled. I mean, there's, there's really a lot of stuff there because they use this for, because it's a recursive function and you can invite the recursion in another way, memoizing this and that, that's actually having the book as well. It's really awesome. The problem with this algorithm really is that it's, um, that, it's, that it's worse than exponential because it keeps forgetting. Because, you know, Fibonacci of 4 is, by its definition, the sum of 3 and 2. So then you have to calculate the Fibonacci of 3, which is the sum of 2 and 1. So now we had 2 already twice, and they don't cross-pollinate. So it does this stuff over and over and over, so it gets, it's really bad. And it's a really good example for showing off just how cool one is, because we know that R doesn't do this well, because R... Um, because of the structure of the language doesn't do recursion really well. I mean, it's already sort of coping with function calls quite a bit because it has to keep too much metadata around. If you then do that recursively, it's clearly not its strength. So the kid who asked that on Stack Overflow, I think, did Fibonacci of 35 and kind of cried, oh my God, it took half an hour, what's wrong? You know, why is the universe mean at me? And that's just, it's an expensive algorithm, dude. I mean, um, so, but, and, and then if you, you know, Google around that, there's basically two definitions, one that includes zero and the other that doesn't, I include it here. So if you then do 
from 0 to 10, you get those 11 answers, from 0 to 55. And then you can time these, and these ratios have stayed, you know, approximately the same. The outright times have gotten shorter because my computers got better, or our computers got better over the years. F of 10, basically no cost, you know, 14 milliseconds, 100 times. Uh, just adding 5 to it gives us a factor of 10 that used to be actually north of 10, now it's just slightly south of 10. So f of 15, 130 milliseconds rather than 14 for f of 10. Going from 15 to 20, about the same increase again. Instead of um, 130 milliseconds, now it's 1500 milliseconds. And uh, that's, that's the way it keeps going. So 25 is more expensive, 30 and so on. But um, again, easy peasy in, um, with CPP function looks just about the same. You know, we have a type, we have to put an int in there. We have to throw a couple of semicolons around just because the language wants it. Um, and quick test, of course, before you benchmark, always nice to see that you get the same results. And if you then put these two together, it's about a factor of 275. And depending on the machine that I used it to, I think it used to be as bad as 600. I've gotten 400 quite a bit, but you know, there's nothing that happens with multi-threading or what have you, and this is sort of a, an i5, nothing, nothing fancy. 275 is still, of course, brutal, but we know that recursive function calls is good for us. So, and what I, what I usually say around something like that, I mean, for, for normal tasks with looping and assignments and all the things, you can pretty easily get 40, 60, sometimes 80 x. If you're doing something on the order of 100, something crazy is going on, or, um, you know, you, you, you had bad luck uh, with your R code in the first place that you avoided when you went to C++. I mean, you, you probably smooth something else out if it's, if it's that much, much bigger. So, um, yeah, so, Speed, you know, we're here for you. We can definitely get it. Uh, and there's really sort of, there's two variants to speed. How fast does my code run? You know, how much time does it, does it take for me to get this answer for the computation I desire an answer for? The other one really is how long does it take me to sit down and write this code? And that's another thing, and that I feel relatively strongly about, is where RCPP helps. Um, we're not writing make files anymore. We don't really have to worry about how a small package with RCVP were built on Windows or the Mac. I mean, it just, it, it just works. We're, we're leveraging things that are already as really, really well. And, you know, we just did a little bit of additional elbow grease and that's sort of, that's, that's there. And yeah, and in our studio, you get, you know, decent error feedback for both R and C++ and, you know, other languages these days too, so it's, 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 it's good. You, you want a decent sort of work environment and invest some time in learning its tricks and tools and, you know, read some blog posts, talk to other people, it's, it's worth it. Um, um, yeah, let's do this. So I'll just run through a little bit of uh, background material in C++ because, I mean, I have to talk to this about this at, at sort of some point and this, I think, will just get us about to the break in, in, in 15 minutes. So this is, this is super boring and dry, but, you know, we have to cover it at, at some point. I sort of went there when I showed you the first full example for um, source CPP. Um, so this is what you would get in, in CS100 or in C++100 because this is... Um, the minimal viable program. So now I'm showing you basically a program, something that creates an executable, rather than an add-on function that we stick into R. The um, main difference is one of labeling. Uh, a program for C and C++ is something that has a signature of in main and then some arguments, the command and arguments that you can point or if you don't have any void. And if you have, if you have a main function, it just wants to be a main executable. You can't link a helper function main into R from R Studio because, you know, um, R Studio will have, I mean, well, mind you, well, I, I don't know, and then R has a main, but anyway, I mean, that, that, that's just a different use case, but I'm just showing you this because we're building a program now. So this is, this is what it would take to do everybody's intro. You know, what for the computer scientists is the IRIS data set, I mean, the convention is to print hello world, and you can do that in C++ in two ways because we have the print format that is, like C, which is actually like the one that we have in R, and that's no surprise because C came from Bell Labs, S came from Bell Labs, so we have a printf in R that looks like the C function printf, so if you learned the one in R, congratulations, you're halfway done to outputting in, 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 in C. C++ does it as well, but it added something else, which was these input-output streams, IO streams, and that's this business with the um, less than less than redirecting. So they're, they're, they're both equivalent. 
um, formatting can be a little harder sort of this way. And how does one turn something like this into a program? Well, you will need access somehow in your C, C++ IDE or on the command line to a compiler. G++ is often there, and if you do G++ minus O, you give the name of the executable um, that, that you want there, um, and it will compile the code and link other implicitly required system libraries to it so that the program can, can execute. So I could show you that, we will just, just fly through. In the simplest case, nothing external is used. In a slightly more involved case, you may be using something external. So here I'm showing you how you can make use of an auxiliary library provided by R um, if its build has turned on. Uh, most Linux distros do that. I am unaware what Brew defaults to, but I'm sure you can get it as an add-on on Brew. Basically, here I'm saying I want mathematical functions from R, and I want to use them in a non-R context, so that's why I have to put the define in there, mathlib standalone, so that the header file knows, oh, yeah, okay, I'm not, I'm not going into the R program, I'm being used somewhere else. It needs that for some internals. So that's why you have these two. Same flow, you know, as I mentioned earlier, if you want to use something, you have to bring a header in. But after you brought the header in, now we have the identifier QNorm. And QNorm does exactly what we do in R. It's just we're now accessing the C API variant, it has fewer default. Um, arguments. In R, we can just call Q norm with a single argument and the other four are implied because the first is a quantile, the next two are mean and standard deviation and the other two are um, whether you want the tails in logs and or I cannot remember but uh, true and false is uh, one and zero is the default. No, it's, it's basically the set defined in the header. So it's a, it's a bunch of utility functions. So it's, 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 it's a Q, P, D, R. So you get the random number generator. But it's basically just a, a set of mathematical helper functions. But it's a large enough set and it's, it's popular. So basically when, when the Julia language bootstrapped itself and when Doug Bates went from here to there in order to give them a lot of special functions, they just wrapped around that one. And then they, you know, got all religious because that's GPL and they don't want to, so now they want to read. But, but you know, so that, that pops up in a couple of other places. So it's a, and, and you basically get the benefit of sort of, you know, Brian Ripley, Martin Michler style obsession with precision because it's the very code that goes into R and you can basically just, just, just use it. But your system, and that's, that's why I show this, will then have a library somewhere in order to use this. So this is now, the, the, the Hello World example didn't need anything else because we didn't use any extra resources. On a Unix computer, here, because we opted to write a program to milk some R functions, we have to be explicitly say, well, where do I get the headers from? Apart from the fact when the system headers, which user include actually is. So on my particular system, I don't have to say it explicitly, but as soon as it departs from that directory, you have to be explicit. That's why I'm showing it. So that's the first line. The first line compiles, because now we're saying, find headers and users include and do a minus C, just a compilation, which turns the CPP file into a .o file, and the following line then takes the .o file in the middle, as well as the instruction of minus capital L, where do I find this library, and minus lowercase l, what library is that, to attach that library to the object code from the previous step to generate the executable QNOM R math. And that's all... Um, Super industrial strings will never fail, but it's not portable, and that's why it's a pain. So you write this one way, um, you know, for your Linux computer, and then you give it to your sister who has a Mac, and uh, the paths are different, the extensions are different. I mean, it's sort of all taken care of relatively easily, but it's still, it's still, you still have to take care of it. And for the Windows, it's different yet again, and we avoid sort of all of that by relying on the R build infrastructure underlying. So that, that's, that's kind of neat. Um, but that's, you have to keep this in mind. For use with RCPP, I showed you that because sometimes you want to link to external libraries and you will get possibly two different types of errors. Um, identifier not known, and then you either didn't put the include file in, so the compiler didn't know what you wanted to use there. You basically reference to something and it tells you, I've never heard of this, I can't work with this. And then it fails at the compilation step, and that's the minus I stage. Or um, it will find that build object code 
but you got the link instruction wrong or omitted it or sort of something, and then it can't actually form the final executable out of it. And that's a linking error because now you, in your code, made reference to these are those instructions, and you have to sort of glue them to your executable, and you didn't tell it where to glue them from, and that's then the second error. And, and, and it helps to think through this with the minus i and minus, minus capital I, minus capital L. And then sort of, you know, really, really high level differences. Um, we are statically typed here. The first line shows something that's completely legal in R and common. You know, you can reuse a variable name. You assign 314 to X, and then you assign a string to it. There's absolutely no problem. The identifier I, X just, just changes type. That works. That's why it's called dynamic. In compiled languages, it's often different, so you have to give it a particular type, and that type then cannot change. Uh, common types are int. Uh, in, in R, we only have one of 32 bits. Here, we also have long int um, that can get uh, crossed by unsigned, and you only have posit positive ones. Uh, real valued numbers used to be called float and double in the days when computer space was, was, um, was more precious. Nobody uses float anymore. We just use double because you know, we have the 64 bits. Bool is a logical. Char is a single character. Um, there is no default string type, but sort of almost, because we have standard string, and by now all systems have them in a compatible way. Um, basically, by default, everything is a scalar, whereas in R, that's sort of different, so you have to get used to that. And with classes and structs, you can form objects. I think I have a really brief example, but we don't really have time in the three hours for that. Um, another high-level point is C++ is a better C. They're, they're, they're pretty close. For, while, if, switch are both there, functions are similar. A um, um, bit more general uh, signatures allowed. Um, you don't have to point at management explicitly, thanks to the STL. That's a really important topic. But again, we don't really have time for that anymore. So, you know, when I was little and an undergrad and learned C, I mean, we spent a lot of time of getting pointers and all that stuff right, and it's really good to work through this once. It's really painful. It helps you with the other things, but basically now so the common realization is you don't really need that anymore because in C++ you kind of just say, have me a vector, stick an element into the vector, stick another element into the vector, stick another element in the vector, and it's the implementation of the vector, the library implementation that takes care of getting sufficient memory and releasing it afterwards. You don't do that, just, just how R does it for us. And it's, it changes your worldview. I mean, it's, it's really good. You still need to know the other stuff once you become you know, a C++ library implementer, but um, you know, life's short, why do that? <laughs> <laughs> we rather stay in an application space. Um, um, and, and then you have to worry much less about it. So really quickly, what's this object-oriented business? So you can think of structs as something very similar to our lists. They can just contain different things and they have names in there. So here I have sort of, you know, token example. We have a date and a person and we're using the definition of a date for the person because the person has to have a birth date. So date, you know, year, month, day is used in person as birthday element as well as then first name, last name, and these. So that's, but that's sort of C level because we're just defining a data structure. Where C++ then differed is that you can marry these variables in an object, which was the struct before, now with functions. So a class in C++ really is, ignore the private public for, well, I mean, that's just visibility stuff. So a, a common, you know, um, hard-nosed design pattern, if we want to be verbose, is that, that you keep your data internal and don't let it access. So this is sort of a textbook example. So we have year, month, date, and then we can set the date once, and we set all three of them, and then we have basically three read-only accessors for it. And uh, the internal representation is shielded, and once it's, once it's, well, I guess you could call it set again, but then you can do, anyway, um, with constructors and other stuff. So think of the object orientation as basically marrying data with code accessing that data. Um, you can spend years sort of refining this. It's pretty tricky. Uh, this is what I just referred to, STL, generic programming. Um, really key invention. Um, it separated away the data type uh, think of data type as something as, for example, as a set in the mathematical sense, or a vector, or a list, and the operations on them, keeping as many as the operations common. So basically, you know, um, the common example is sort of that you have a vector, as well as a list, as well as um, 
uh, queues that you can access on both sides, and then you sort of operations as pushback, popback, um, are available for all. But the performance guarantees are specific to the particular implementation, sort of lists, lists um, excuse me, vectors, just like our vectors in R are always a particular chunk of memory. So it's really expensive to remove one in the middle if you want to shrink it, because then you have to take all of the ones before and all the ones after, copy them over, and create a shorter one, whereas lists are topic typically implemented by sort of sequences of pointers, as in the algo book, so then you just remove one point, and that's, that's, that's quick. So the removal, list has an advantage, uh, but for other things, vector has. And, and the, the, the key thing is that, that you get performance guarantees for operations on particular uh, representations, and the really nice thing is that you can switch the types around, so you, if you have something that inserts element, you can switch between a list and a vector really, really easily and don't have to change your code. There, there's a, that, that's where this generic comes from. But that, that gets too technical really, really quickly. Basically, pushback, popback, uh, all of the, several of these have it. Begin and end show you the beginning, the you know, first and last size and number of elements. But then there's a difference between list and vector that only list would, would also allow you to insert at the front. And, you know, the set, multiset, uh, hash maps and sort of stuff like that don't have enough time to go over this. So basically, how does, this, how does this work? We've seen earlier how to do a loop, because I made you sum things up. Um, a more general notion of how to iterate over these different containers um, is by using an iterator and incrementing the iterator till you have, uh, till it uh, would be equal to the, to the end sign, and then you can always access that in the middle. But that's, you know, that's really, actually, that was a, that was a good laugh yesterday. So I was just, you know, standing around here shooting the breeze and someone came up to me and kind of said, great, really looking forward to your tour tomorrow. I've never done C++. I have the evening free. How do I learn it? <laughs> I love Australia. I mean, that's sort of the spirit. But I mean, in all seriousness, that's exactly how you have to approach it because all of this is sort of incremental. It's a fundamentally complex language. You can't learn everything at once. So you just do it in increments. That's sort of the right thing. This is basically our sum equivalent from earlier if you do it via the STL. I have sort of problems with that because, you know, it's just, that almost makes it like a new language. It's so much easier with RCBB Sugar because we s named everything the same way it is in, in, um, in R already, but it's, it's rich um, and, and not well documented. I have a really old, uh, inherited from work, a really old uh, Edison Wesley book that, that defines that. There's, there's sort of a, uh, more than 100 algorithms in there, but yeah, find, count, transform. Transform is sort of like, like S apply, sort of sweep something through for each as well. Inner product, inner product is the dot product, and, you know, maybe mathematical notation. Um, what often happens so for accumulate, for example, is begin iterator, end iterator, so that implicitly says we want to sweep through from beginning to end because the notion of the iterator is that the, the, the sequences is guaranteed. And because we're calculating a sum, we need to be able to initialize the sum. That's why that zero thing is there at the, at the end. Um, template programming, it's really complicated, I don't have time, uh, just, you know, sort of one reasonable example is because our language operates on types, and types are required, you know, when you have a function that computes the minimum of two supplied elements, you're in trouble, and the program complexity uh, grows, because you can calculate the min between two ints by creating a function min, int a, int b, and then you have to do it again for a long, and a double, and, some other, and that's where templating helps, because this is how you would do that. You would say basically template of any type name t, and then when you need the function, you just instantiate it by dropping in the t in the angle brackets, and then you're just saying, you know, this is now returning the min, and it's not altered, hence a const of x and y, and it uses this funky uh, ternary operator that's sort of the c equivalent of as if else. If y is less than x, and the question mark basically says it's the if context. If true, use y, colon, else, use x. And this now implements it for all different types, and then you can you know, do it. And, and all it requires is um, that the type you want to template on has a, um, has a, has a less than comparison implemented. But you know, really gnarly details. And you can use templates too with helper function to sweep things around, but don't really have time for that. That's basically just, here we're using transform to sweep an operator square that I just upper, uh, defined up there by, you know, getting a t and returning a t times t, but um, no time for that. If you need to, and again, these are links in the PDF. There's a really helpful free C++ book, Labor of Love by an academic in Rotterdam, I think, somewhere in Holland. 
It's called the C++ annotations. Comes in various forms, HTML, PDF, PDF types that do letter paper and US paper. The C++ FAQ is okay. And the, um, uh, surprisingly, actually, the, the, um, the resource page for the C++ tag on Stack Overflow is wickedly good. There's a really long book list, as I recall, it's sort of in four segments. I know nothing. I once knew something I want to catch up. Uh, sort of, I'm intermediate, and then the fourth level, I'm God. What do you have to forget? So. <laughs> and then um, debugging is as painful as in other languages. You know, we all hate computers. Uh, it's just, it's, it's awful. Uh, everybody claims that they have a magic trick. Nobody does. And over a beer, we all sort of, you know, commiserate and kind of say, yep, lots of printf's. Um, uh, there are debuggers. Uh, there are ways to invoke R with the debuggers that's hidden away in writing R extensions. Um, there are tools like Valgrind that also comes up in writing R extensions, or if you're really unlucky in, um, in Gnarly emails from the cred maintainers. Likewise, these sanitizers are good. Um, uh, it's really, it's all part of this resurgence of, of C++ in the last couple of years. The, the tooling has gotten better, so these are things that helped a little with the competition between G++ and Clang++ or LLVM. Um, so they, they both have that now. So ASUN stands for, um, UB stands for Undefined Behavior Sanitizer. Um, Crap. I once know who knew what ASUN stands for. Well, basically, it's sort of writing out of memory, having undefined, it's sort of, stuff that you can get to if you instrument the compilation correctly uh, dur during runtime. And it's basically, it's just like fatter debug builds, but it requires a bit of tooling. And I think with that, we're at the, we're at the break. Oh yeah, I have this one more slide. So uh, of course, once you do something like that for any real projects, but you know, we all know this and adhere to this, by all means, please put your code into version control. And uh, for productivity, it, um, in the long run, it's really, it's really worthwhile to pick sort of a set of tools and learn them and then stick with them. And I don't care what you use. You know, I'm, I'm friends with people who use VI. I'm that tolerant. Or if it's Eclipse, or, but uh, you know, I, I got a lot of joy and the usefulness out of Emacs, so I like that. And, yeah, and then uh, you, you get sort of some value. And there's still, I could spend another 50 years learning about all that, but it's, 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 it's worth it. It's good. Um, yeah. And, uh, a break, I think, a full half hour, and then we're just um, discussing a lot of examples, and with that, uh, we'll segue eventually over to ML, uh, via Amadio to MLPEC, to the slightly ambitious machine learning in the, in the title. If you have questions, Mitchell and I, of course, are happy to take them. Uh, you know, if you want to beef your system up. Yes, yeah. yeah. And, you know, again, We'll have another 90 minutes, so it's, there's, there's, there's a limit to how much we can.